it didn't listen to me. It walked out of the thicket, it turned around and looked at me. They looked up and in this tree, there was a monkey man. And the monkey man jumped down out of the tree and started running away. And suddenly they're right in front of the car slams on the brakes and manages to stop and he's skidding because it's not quite, you know, um, gravelling. And for literally for about a second and a half, they just stood there because they don't know where to go and you tell them panicking, they're like roof flapping and their, their, their face is like twitching. Welcome back to Bigfoot Society, a podcast where we focus on cryptids, the strange and the unexplained of this world. If you've got a story or something weird to share, send an email over to me at bigfootsociety at gmail.com. And if you'd like to support this show, head on over to patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot Society. And now on with the show. All right, Bigfoot Society, we've got a Awesome interview lined up for you here. Got a new friend, Mr. Thomas Steenberg, hanging out with us tonight. How's it going, sir? I'm doing fine, Jeremy. How are you? I'm doing I'm doing great. Just hanging out on a Friday night. Uh, so if your listeners aren't aware, uh, Thomas is a Canadian Bigfoot researcher uh, who's been in the game researching since 1978, but he's been interested since age five as well. But uh, any other things our listeners uh, need to know about before we get into the the Bigfoot stuff, Thomas, about you? Well, uh, Canadian. Uh, you use the Canadian term all the time, Sasquatch. Bigfoot's the American term. Came out in the late 50s. Uh, okay. I am strictly zoological. Okay. I do believe in the existence of the creature, but to me it is a, if it exists, it is a higher primate, no more, no less. I'm not into the paranormal or supernatural explanations or or what is known in the Sasquatch community as a whole as the woo. Mm. Yeah, so I'm strictly old school and strictly zoological. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Have been, have been I've published three books and co-authored two others. I've been doing this a long time. You have been, and if people, man, we talk about your books for for a few minutes. Um, Bigfoot in Alberta, I'm a big fan of. That's that's such a fun book. There's so many interesting encounters that you've brought into that book. Uh, it's it's very it's a very fun read, uh, and people be like, oh, Bigfoot in Alberta. It sounds uh, it's really interesting. You should check it out if you're into Bigfoot at all. It reads like, like a well-written story. Uh, it's not just, and this guy saw this guy, uh, this Sasquatch. No, it's well, well-written. And also, uh, of course, you were involved with co-authoring uh, that uh, famous book with Mr. Uh, Christopher Murphy, um, uh, Meet the Sasquatch, correct? Correct. Came out in 2004. It was so uh, Chris Murphy's idea, but... I co-authored with them, as well as the late John Green. Yeah, I have a uh, a copy of that uh, on my as uh, a Kindle copy, and it is. If if listeners don't have that book yet, I mean, it is the absolute. I would say number one reference material for if you really want to know what's going on with Bigfoot in history and the the guys that have come before and. You know, the uh, First Nations uh, history of Sasquatch. I mean, that's where you want to go. It is very well written. Uh, what was it like co auth like putting all that stuff together with Chris? Do you, do you have any stories about uh, getting well, that it, together? It was, it was Chris Murphy's idea. He wanted to put out what could almost be a textbook that could be used, like, in classrooms and anything from high school to university, right? on the subject. So it was Chris Murphy's baby. And I liked what I heard and what he wanted to do. And so did the late John Green. So we got together with him and, uh, and we, and, and we, we were all on my archives and John Green's archives and, and the history and what we knew and the research and, 
it all got put together a lot of it and believe me a lot was left out really? uh, yeah yeah and it ended up in the in the uh, 2004 uh publication of meet the sasquatch which um uh, came out in hardcover at first, and then it came was republished in softcover, and then Chris decided to update it again, and, and titled it "Know the Sasquatch." But uh, mm-hmm. both of me, John Green, and myself, uh, well, John Green wanted nothing to do because he wanted to include a bunch of material that we didn't agree with. I still sure. helped him with it, but uh, I said I don't want my name on it because uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't want. Uh, uh, and no, thought there were certain things in it about certain people and their activities that Chris thought should be included. And I, as far as I'm sure, it was just absolute nonsense. And gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. No, so, I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 But I like Meet the Sasquatch the best because um, uh, that and the uh, uh, Sasquatch in British Columbia, which was published in uh, uh, 2012, co authored by Chris Murphy and myself. And it's all about the history of Sasquatch in British Columbia from 1700s to 2012. Wow. That's, yeah. that's it, was, it was a very, very big book. Um, again, we had to leave a lot of stuff out because it was just getting too big. So <laughs> Out of that British Columbia one? Yeah, the British Columbia one. Yeah. Oh, man. What kind of stuff did you leave out of that? Well, there were all kinds of, like, the stories that were really, we like to include the ones that have been, uh, uh, you know, researched quite a bit by sure. either john green or myself or, or uh, and chris or all three of us and a lot of the secondhand stuff you know the ones that we heard a report we were sent a letter and but we never really followed up on it because someone's telling us about something they saw 15 years ago sure you know yeah you know there's really nothing to do with it except hear the story we, we really like, uh, well, you, you see Meet the Sasha, it goes into minute details. It does. Especially, especially historical events like the PG film and things like that. There's a lot of things we know that a lot of people don't. And there's there's been a lot of, through talk and hearsay and through the years, a lot of uh, stuff like with the Parish and Gillen film, people think uh, it's true, is not. <laughs> You know, mm. and a lot of facts got turned out, like where was the film shipped from? Where was it developed and stuff? And we don't know. Well, I know. I can tell you right now where it was developed. It was developed in the Ford Motion Picture Lab in Seattle, Washington. I can even give you the whole phone number. <laughs> you give me the phone number of the, the photo lab? Yeah. Cool. Uh, Oh, yeah, 206 682 2510. You can try, but they closed their doors about eight years ago. It's the building's still there, but the lab is. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. And it was kind of funny. We found out about that because it was always a question where did Aldi Atley take the film? Where did he get it developed? No one seemed to know. And then a colleague of mine, the late Bill Miller, who before he ever got into Sasquatch, was one of the leading. Uh, unofficial authorities on the Kennedy assassination. Oh, wow. He, he just happened to go into the Ford Motion Picture Lab in Seattle because he wanted to buy uh, uh, 8 millimeter Kodachrome 2 film because he wanted to do comparisons down in Dallas with the Sabruder film. Mm. Somehow the topic of Bigfoot came up, an old guy who managed the place said, oh, yeah, we developed that movie here. We showed it on the wall right there. <laughs> really? Oh, oh, tell me about it. And he said, hey, sure. He said, oh, we goes, goes in, he says, first, it was a businessman who came in here and had the original film developed. We developed it. We showed it on the wall for him before he took it away. Businessman, Al Atley, Roger Patterson's brother. Right. And about three weeks later, this little cowboy showed up to have a couple of copies made. Roger Patterson. There you so, go. So that's how we know where the film was developed. That's awesome. That is, yeah. That's really cool. Man, what are the chances? Like. Just randomly, Bigfoot come, gets brought up, and there you go. <laughs> let's uh, let's start at the. Uh, we'll we'll backtrack a, a little bit. I want there's some uh, some foundational questions that I want to ask you. So you alluded to that uh, Bigfoot's been on your mind since you were a little kid. So mm-hmm. I'm curious, what was the the catalyst that got you into it ever since age five? Okay, well, what really started for me was back in the mid-1960s when I was a wee lad. 
my parents brought home a, a hardcover Reader's Digest book, which was uh, for education purpose for myself and my sister, who was two years younger than I am. And, you know, in this hardcover di Reader's Digest book, you, you could find chapters on everything from, you know, Rocky Mountains, flora, uh, weather patterns, hurricanes, volcanoes. And, of course, it had a big, big section on the age of the dinosaurs with those beautiful old colored paintings of T-Rex standing straight up and dragging his tail on the ground that they know wasn't the way it was now. Mm. And a brontosaurus in a swamp because they said he was so heavy he had to stay in water because he couldn't support himself in his legs. Something paleontology says is not true now. <laughs> you know, But people thought it was true in the mid-60s. And right, right in the middle of the dinosaur section was this little two-page article called The Thing in Loch Ness with the usual three blurry black and white pictures, right? I don't know, something in my head, young mind snapped because I must have read that 80 times. And I pestered my parents, pestered my parents. They got me a library card and say, here, kid, go ahead. You know, and I went there to find out about, you know, and I knew very young I was never going to move to Scotland. So and I, I went trying to find out about more about that. Of course, you come across books and things that talk about other aspects of cryptozoology. And I don't even think that term was used back then used to refer to as monsters. And uh, I read about this thing in Western Canada called the Sasquatch. In the United States, they called it Bigfoot. Mm. I became intrigued. And I just, I think what really did it, not long after that, on a school night when I should have been in bed, I came into the living room thinking I was going to get a blast for my parents who were sitting in there watching a movie, the old black and white TV. And my mother said, oh, and I think my father said something to the, the effect of, well, let's let the lad watch this. He's interested in this kind of thing. And my mother said something along the lines, oh, no, he can't watch this. He'll have bad dream, blah, blah, blah. My father won the argument. I'm sure he has regretted that ever since. <laughs> and what was plain was that old Hammer horror film starring Peter Cushing, the abominable snowman of the Amelitis. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> and it was Sasquatch after that. And uh, I did my time uh, uh, in the Canadian Army. I served seven years with the 1st Battalion PPCLI. And I got posted to the uh, Curry Barracks in Calgary, which is just outside the Rocky Mountains. And uh, going to Canex, started coming back. I saw the rock one winter, early winter morning. I saw the Rocky Mountains for the first time in my life. And it looks so beautiful. It almost looked like one of those phony 1950 backdrop paintings in a movie. You know? Mm. It, it almost, it was so beautiful. It looked fake. You know, it was beautiful. I, I just, I must have looked like an idiot. I stood on that bridge looking at him for like 30 minutes. And the thought went through my head, you know, no one's ever built a wall between Eastern BC and Western Alberta. If they've been seen in Eastern BC, they have to be seen here too. So what I did is I just took out ads in local press in, in Southern Alberta, Sasquatch. Anyone who believes they had a sighting of this creature, please contact Thomas Steenberg in a phone number. And I didn't expect much result, but my phone was ringing almost daily. Wow. Yeah. And through that, I met the late Professor Vladimir Markotic, who was a professor of anthropology and, and archaeology at the University of Calgary. He was right. He helped put together the book Sasquatch and Other Unknown Hominids with Grover Krantz in the early 1980s. And, uh, he called me up, and I guess I I impressed him enough with my knowledge that we kind of sort of became unofficial partners. He did the academic stuff because he was a senior citizen even then. He was already in his mid seventies, and I did the field work. And uh, through Vladimir, I eventually met the late Grover Krantz, and on my own, I met the late John Green, the late Rennie Day, and mm -hmm. the late Bob Titmus. I got to know all these guys and I did, became friends and did work with all of them, all with the exception of Peter Byrne, who I didn't meet face to face until 2010. Even though we wow. exchanged letters every now and then and phone calls. Yeah. When you were just starting out as a young researcher, what was on your bookshelf for reference at that time period? Well, the biggest one was John Green's. And when I started, John, that was the year John Green published his book, Sasquatch, the Apes Among Us. Wow. And many of us considered that, the, you know, the Bible. 
Exactly. Before that, I'd say the best work was Ivan T. Senator's work, Abominable Snowman of, of, uh, of North America. Oh, what was it? It was Abominable Snowman, Legend Come to Life, 1961 yep, publication. Yeah, that uh, was a great book. And of course, John Green's uh, early works, The Small Lake Track of Sasquatch, which he published in 69, Sasquatch File 69, you know, um, and all those books. But there weren't that many of them back then. But they're, they're not like today, you know. Today, but those, just... those, those are my reference points. But I was young and naive, and someone yelled Sasquatch, I, I believed them, you know. It was through venting. And I adopted right from the beginning, I adopted my official policy and a philosophy. And that philosophy is stick to the facts and never mm. deviate from the facts. That has been my policy from day one. And that's what I did. And I learned things. You know, uh, there are a lot of people who like to make up stories. It happens mm. all the time. And especially since inventions of great tools like the internet, it's become a soapbox for every snake oil salesman out there. Let's face it. Okay? Yeah. 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 And uh, what impresses me is people who saw something, they don't know what it was. They tell me about it and they almost want me to tell them what it was. Hmm. You know, and I've encountered that. Uh, but even from the beginning, like the first real investigation I ever did was I'm not I can't remember he was an Australian tourist from New Zealand but he had a rental car and he was going to Banff from Calgary on the old 1A highway and he he saw what he described as a great big bloody orangutan crossing the road in problem it was reddish brown really? color and that's what he called an orangutan he had never heard of the Sasquatch he had heard of the Eddie and the Amelie he never heard of the Sasquatch and he saw the article in the paper because someone pointed it out to him when he was talking about it. And I met him out there. And you could see scuff marks or something up there. But I, to me, the man was telling the truth. He wasn't saying he saw a scratch, but he had no idea what he saw. Hmm. He just described it. And, uh, well, sounds like it was to me. If that was someone's, or someone lost an orangutan that grew very long by peel legs. Yeah. Those are some of my favorite uh, stories. I, I've heard a few that are similar to that, where it's like a tourist that comes from another country. They don't really know what's what's going on over here. And they're like, you guys got monkeys over here? Mm -hmm. What's with all the monkeys? And then the people that live here are like, wait, what are you talking about? We don't have monkeys. And you're like, uh, I mm -hmm. saw some fishing. You know, and it's just like, it blows my mind, dude. But, yeah, I had a fish like that in the Clearwater River in the mid-'80s, so guy uh, was out hunting with an American friend and American yelled over, uh, Hey, you got apes here in the mountains? Cause no, <laughs> that's the best. That's the best part in uh Bigfoot in Alberta. I laughed so oh, yeah, okay. hard yeah, I when I that. read that part, I was yeah, like, yeah. are you kidding me? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it was just splashing water in itself. When it detected their presence, it left and they never saw it again. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you're, and you, you pretty much said this already, but I just want to, I just want to clarify. So what, if I was to say, Thomas, what is Bigfoot? It mm -hmm. sounds like you've got a pretty clear answer. It's one of two things. Okay. It is a higher primate that lives in the wilderness areas of North America, Canada, and the United States, maybe a few other places, but I'm kind of skeptical on that. Or it's mythology and folklore, one or the other. Can you go into, uh, I'm, I'm curious what you mean by mythology and folklore. It's all, it's all a big, uh, fairy story. Okay. That's just caught on, but keeps passing it on. Oh, so, and then the, all these reports are just the collective people having some like, see, oh yeah, I saw it too. Every year, whenever you're interviewing a witness, you've got to keep this fact in mind. Okay. There's only three possibilities here. Three. One, they saw a Sasquatch. Two, 
They mistook someone or something for a Sasquatch or three, they're lying. There are no other possibilities. Mm. Mm -hmm. Is there something, I, I'm sure you've interviewed countless amount amounts of uh, witnesses over the years since 1978, back in the 70s. Is there something that when you're interviewing a witness um, that, you know, sets off a trigger where you're like, okay, this is this is legit or is it just you can you can tell by how shaken up they are or how do you view that i'm not naive to think that everyone who's ever talked to me has mm -hmm. seen a sasquatch okay most of the time when i know they're bsing me i i learned very early on don't confront them i just let them finish it i say thank you very much and they never hear from me again and hopefully on hopefully on air and they'll say, Well, that wasn't much fun. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> you know, I made the mistake of confronting people in the early years and it led to, you know, oh, like no. one woman one woman who claimed a sass was coming into her backyard and having sex with her every night. I mean, well, ma'am, I don't know oh, about dear. your 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 sexual fantasies, but I can tell you this, I don't believe it happened. And she just went on a tirade on me for like 10 minutes. Oh, that set her I, off. I, wow. I saw a major in the army couldn't swear that well. So <laughs> it was unbelievable. <laughs> you know, but yet, you know, what, what strikes me is I like the latest one. I just finished interviewing British Columbia file 226. Okay? Wow. That's how many of British Columbia I have. And uh, it, talking about something he saw while fishing in the river in 2015 okay very convincing story i have yet to talk to his ex-girlfriend who was in the boat with him claiming to have seen it too i hope to do that soon to get confirmation okay sounds completely convincing and it sounded like he really wanted to get this off his chest i asked him if he ever reported anything else he said yeah once about five years ago on some website on sasquatch i mentioned what happened without giving my name and he wants complete confidentiality. He doesn't want his name out there. Sure. I don't give it. But there's one thing that bothered me. He, he said he saw the eyes glowing on the riverbank. And he came to the, the conclusion the reason the eyes were glowing is they were reflecting off the water and the polished polished aluminum of my boat. You know, he thought the mm -hmm. full moon was doing that. Okay. Well, that sounds reasonable. In other words, he says one of those bright lights where you almost don't need a flashlight. They were sort of tied off in a snag, getting some rest. And this thing chucked a couple of rocks near the boat and got his attention. He saw it squatting, sitting on the edge of the water. And when he yelled over to his girlfriend, <laughs> you know, you know, back at it again, it was gone. Wow. <clears throat> but she saw it walking off into the bush. Our third rock came out and they landed in the water. Okay, it sounded perfectly legit. However, I checked, I did some checking. There was no full moon on the 15th of August, 2015. The full moon was on the 29th. Uh-oh. Yeah. So the beginning of the month, the first, it was the end of a full moon cycle. And the next one didn't start. You go two days before, it, the moon looks full, but isn't quite. You have the full moon night. And then it looks partially full the next two nights after that, right? But then usually the rest of the month, it's in shadow shape. You only see a crescent moon or whatever. On the 15th, it was almost fully obscured. So I have to conclude either he was mistaken about the full moon, but he said he could see the moon right behind it, or he's mistaken about the date it happened. But he is trying to remember sure. something back in 2015. So again, I'm going to see what, what the girlfriend says. Yeah. Okay. But simple That's fact is, the night, in the night he said this happened, there was no full moon. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. And, and you're taking reports all the time still, it sounds like. I mean, 200 some odd reports. Yeah, in this particular area of BC, we've had a lot of natural disasters in the last couple of years. Forest fires, mountain slides, landslides. Matter of fact, a year ago, in this time, we were almost completely cut off by landslides that took out all the roads around us here and stuff like that. And it just played havoc. Hmm. Starting reports in this particular area have almost dropped down to zero. Hmm. We're just right here. And when I do hear about something, it's like the one I just told about. Someone, someone's telling me about something they saw eight years ago. Wow. Do you think uh, they got wiped out because of the you know, 
no, I don't. I, 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 it's not as many people going into wilderness areas because all the oh, roads sure. are. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, and gotcha. there are other explanations. And forest fires. Who wants to go into a burnt out timber area? You know, yeah. they go. Yeah, they go yeah, where yeah. it's still green. You know, I think I tend to think that may have something to do with it, and that, and the fact there's been a lot of logging activity as well in this particular area. Because other areas, they still seem to be happening. And I have had two people at first contact me that wanted to tell me something. And then, for whatever reason, no knowing themselves, he decided, no, I, I really don't want to get involved anymore in this. I'm just going to put it behind me and move on. I've had two of those in the last year, yeah. And I don't blame them. If they don't want to talk, they don't want to talk. You know, you know the ones I, I don't like, well, I, I still get the odd uh, crank call, you know, that, I saw Sasquatch. He, he communicated me with his mind rays. <laughs> that's that's a pretty good American accent, Tom. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I hate to say it, but most of all, the hoaxing in the United States has reached since the advent of the internet has reached epidemic proportions. It's so, it seems like it's so easy. It's got to be way easier than it was back in the day, to be honest. I mean, you could just whip out your phone and. Back in the phone. day, you almost had to pry information from a witness. You know, you almost had to pry it out of them. They were very reluctant to talk because they were very reluctant to be called a liar. Now, with the internet, it seems like there's a whole bunch of, especially young guys, say, hey, let's send this into that show, Finding Bigfoot. Maybe they'll push on the show and we can see if we can fool right. them. For no other reason is to, they'll watch a show and high-five each other. Say, hey, hey, we got them. Yeah, you know, that kind of thing. And it happens. It happens a lot. And there's people like this new cryptological phenomenon, Dog Man. Oh, I would love... I Okay, what what are your thoughts on Dog Man? I would it's well, it's everywhere I can't help right now. Wonder, since why I didn't hear of a single instance before Linda, the late Linda Goffrey wrote up that book, The Beast of Bray Road. Yeah, bless her heart. Yeah, 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 yeah. She wrote that book. I never heard of a single case anywhere, and now they're all over the place since that book came out. And it's like she tore an interesting up, point. Up yeah, there were stories in French Canada and Quebec and stuff of what they call the Lou Guru. You know, and things mm -hmm. like that. The dog man phenomena that really didn't get take off into the Bray Road incidents, and Linda Goffrey published a book about it. After that, mm -hmm. the, I mean, they're seen all over the place. Me, I don't mm -hmm. buy it at all. Yeah. There's a uh, there's a question. Uh, this is this is from listener uh, Doug Gear. This says, "What? You know, this is of course what you feel." What is the one piece of evidence that is most convincing for a Sasquatch to exist? To me, the most convincing evidence is the anatomy suggested by a lot of the footprint findings that have gone, been found oh, since the late 1950s. You can't argue about that. There is. There's also the DNA results of some hair samples being sent in. When they say it's primate hair of unknown origin, that's intriguing. Mm. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the PG film still strikes a chord with me because I believe in its authenticity. I think Roger Parrish and Bob Gimlin filmed the Sasquatch October 20th, 1967. And I still sure. do. Yeah. I'm willing to be convinced I'm wrong, but I still think it's authentic. Uh, and ongoing investigations on certain things for you to feel, man, if they're, if they're pulling a prank, they're really going out of their way. Okay, those are probably the best arguments to the existence of the Sasquatch. But what I would really like to see happen is one of these universities or government sponsors expeditions that go in the wilderness areas to do a study that has nothing to do with Sasquatch, you know, either a grizzly bear study or a wolverine study or something like that. Boy, it would be great if one of those groups came up and said, hey, we found these weird tracks. <laughs> or we saw something. <laughs> filmed it right or we saw something and filmed it why doesn't that happen mm. another argument and i'm surprised the skeptical community has never brought this up do you know where banff national park is so i i have heard of it i could not point to it on a, on a map unfortunately yeah, but I, I have heard of it it's on the least slopes of the rocky mountains between the province of alberta and british columbia okay sure 
During the 1980s, they had what was called the red flag program. The Trans Canada goes right through the park. They were trying to get drivers to slow down because so many animals were being killed. There were thousands of these little red flags, you know, everything from a squirrel to a grizzly bear, right? It was terrible. So they finally gave up on that because they just couldn't get the public to slow down. So they decided to build wildlife fences on both sides of the trans Canada oh, yeah, Highway. Yeah, yeah. And they built wildlife tunnels under the highway for the animals to get through. Then they became concerned after a few years, a lot of animals weren't using the tunnels, so they built overpasses on the highway, covered in trees and stuff like that. And they decided to do a study by putting cameras out in these overpasses and tunnels to see what was used them. And, they were, and this went on from the mid-1990s to now, okay? Now, since the mid-1990s, they know that grizzly bears that were alive when they built the overpass and tunnels wouldn't use them. But grizzly bears weaned since the construction have no problem with them. Okay. Now they got cameras out there. And the only out on this, in my logical mind, is the cameras are not 24 7, 365 days a year. They put a couple of cameras on this overpass for a week, then they move them over to another overpass. Blah, okay. Blah, blah. Okay. But since the mid-1990s, they got video footage of every damn thing you can think of, including some very strange people. But guess what they don't have any footage of? Probably Bigfoot. Yeah, Sasquatch. Why? Oh, yeah, Sasquatch. Right, right. Why? Okay. I had The Coquihalla High was built in 1986 to the same thing. They didn't put any overpasses. It's all wildlife tunnels. And I had an idea. I called it the Coquihalla Project. We cover those tunnels with solar-powered trip cameras 365 days a week, 24 hours a day for however long it takes to get footage of every large animal, man size or bigger, we know exists. There. Wow. And if, we, if that does, all that time we get all that footage of other wildlife and we don't get a Sasquatch, that would convince me that the Sasquatch does not exist. And I'm happy to say that the American Forest Service in Washington State have started building overpasses over the I-5 highway. Hmm. They're doing that right now. And unlike the Canadians, they keep their cameras on them all the time. They That's already sad. have amazing yeah. footage of everything from mountain lions to bobcats going through there. Uh, and a, a couple of grizzlies they didn't know had migrated that far south yet, you know. Mm. They know, and they're just getting started. So the next few years, the next 10 years or so is going to be critical. But it That'll bothers me. Very interesting. Yeah, it bothers the hell out of me that those cameras have not picked up the photographic evidence that we are looking for. Yeah. Well, hopefully uh, our friends in in Washington will, will get that all taken care of and we can... Maybe well, get some nice. on, on cameras yeah. for you. That'd be pretty sweet. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. A good, clear image. You know, none of this. Oh, my goodness. Is it a Sasquatch or isn't it? I know it's blurry. <laughs> or it's a shape in the shadows there. Here, I'll draw a red line around it so you can tell what it is. <laughs> oh, you got a lot of those. Right? I'm sure you've had more than a few of those. Yeah. yeah. Any, any video yeah. or photograph where the, the person has to tell you what you're looking at, it evidence it just went out the window. Even if right. it was Sasquatch, yeah. We we kind of touched on the PG film a little bit, but it reminded me of a, of another question that came in from uh, Mark Webster. He says, uh, besides the PG film, do you have any other favorite footage that you've seen over the years? There's other footage that I would like to know a lot more about. Okay. There's footage taken in 2015 of Vancouver Island. It's known as the Fino video. There's something big, hairy, and shaggy in that footage, but you never see it. And the interesting thing is the couple who were walking on this trail, uh, they had lost it for a while. They lost the card from the camera, and they and they just, a couple years later, they found it again. They said, what is this? Hmm. We don't know what it is because it's obscured by the trees. But there's something big and shaggy there. You can see it. If it's not a Sasquatch, it's a large bear standing up against the tree or a rock face there or something. But you don't really get a good look at it. That's an intriguing one. I'd like to know more about it. There is a fascinating so-called skunk ape footage 
that was taken uh, around the same time down in Florida, a man in a canoe where you, you see this ape-like thing and apparently it's going after a snake swimming in the water. That's I'd like to know more, more about that one. And of course, the I still think there's a possibility that the Jebediah State Park footage in 1993 in Northern California may actually show a Sasquatch, but other people disagree with me on that. Hmm. Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to need to look into those. Uh the, also known as the Playboy yeah. Bunny footage. Oh, uh Yeah, I I uh that was on So I do this thing where I love going to Bigfoot encounters, you know, uh rest in peace Bobby Short, but uh she yeah, that's on there and um uh, I was reading about that the other day, but that's such an interesting interview. That's the lady that got interviewed by Jay Leno about the Bigfoot, right? I think that's yeah, yeah, Leno, Leno was making fun of her. Oh, it's terrible. I would love to talk to her and like actually let her talk and have her story out there because Leno was just like, well, I, okay, we'll leave it at that. But you know what I mean? Like, right. He, right. Ugh, he's I mean, it took, it took me a long time to find a copy of that issue of Playboy she's in, because I always feel it's important to have a photograph of the witness for the file. Okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh boy. See, it happened. What it was in the scenario, If you, you've seen the footage, right? The whole footage? I have, yeah. Yeah. This is before the Blair Witch Project made that genre of sticking a camera in your face and looking scared popular. Good point. This was a film crew. They were filming a show that never aired because it was canceled before it was ever completed. Mm. Okay. They were supposed to review motels and camping sites and resorts along the Pacific Northwest and do a review on them. And Anne Marine Goodard was going to be the host of the show. Okay. Now they were going through Jebed they took a wrong turn. They're trying to get somewhere around Eureka and they took a wrong turn to Jebediah State Park and they ended up in this road. They're trying to turn this big massive mobile home around. And they're acting like young people do when they got nothing but time on their hands, too much beer. Yeah. <laughs> they're all making fools of themselves. Anna Marie is in the footage and she's not made up. And I don't think she'd like herself seen this way in public. You know, she's wearing a old red sweater and jeans yeah. and a baseball cap. And she's making a, no makeup and she's making a fool of herself, just like her husband and the rest of the crew were. They're just having fun, you know. And the driver was actually getting annoyed with everybody. <laughs> Because he want, he's having a hard time turning this mobile home. And suddenly he sees what he thinks is a bear crossing the road in front of him. And he goes, look, 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 a bear, a bear. And he starts moving forward towards it. And they tell him to turn the bright lights on. When he does, the thing cuts across the road and disappears in behind a giant redwood tree. The problem is the man who was holding the camera, filming them all making fools of themselves for like 30 minutes before this ever happened, he starts filming it. And the, the image is kind of blurred because you see the back top of the front passenger seat in the way. He took his camera off it for a moment to move and actually sit down in that seat and bring the camera back up again. And when he brought the camera back up again, it stepped in behind the tree and you lost sight of it. And, you know and that's, they all walk out and they go, whoa, what was that? And blah, 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 swearing like banshees. Yeah, it's pretty and, wild. And, and <laughs> there it ended. There it ended. And we got to point out this was like, Two, three years before the Blair Witch Project made that ooh, lost right. film found genre popular, right? Uh -huh. So I still think there was something to it. Other guys, people disagree with me. You know, all was all the setup. It was a publicity stuff for the show. But I point out, well, you know, the show never aired. It's a great point. Yeah. yeah. As far as I know, none of them have ever come forward to say, yeah, it was all publicity stuff. There. You know, most of them don't talk about it at all. And Marie Goodhart still says it happened. Mm. She doesn't know if it was a Sasquatch. It was just something big and shaggy walking in front of their damn, damn mobile home. And nobody knew, other than them knew they were going to be there. They went. They made a wrong turn. They were on a wrong road. Yeah. That is so wild. Yeah. I went there in 2003 to have a look at the area. Oh, you did? Yes. And you can go. And right in behind the giant redwood tree, you know, because there's a big knoll, sap knoll on it. It comes up almost to my, just below my shoulders. Behind that tree, there's like a nine foot drop right into ferns and all kinds of garbage. And you walk through that for about a hundred yards till you get to the riverbank and it disappears, right? You go, it's, I don't know if it's just, there are two trees or large old gold trees with similar knots on them. If you go take a look at the area, okay, you'll know you're at the right one because the road, as you go past this trees, curves to the left. 
that's the right tree. If you're at the tree where it curves to the right, that's the wrong tree. So many people have taken photographs of that wrong tree. <laughs> wow. There. I can't remember it's the first one or the second one, but you'll know it if you ever go there. If you go there and the road curves to the left immediately after that tree, that's the right tree. Yeah, you're at the spot. If you're at the one where the tree, where, where the no, where the road curves to the right after the tree, that's the wrong tree. You're at the wrong spot. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Um, a few guys uh, put in a question for you. That is a similar one. Um, what what is your favorite tobacco for your pipe? Cherry Cavendish, but it's almost impossible to find here now. Yeah. Oh, so you've you got a uh, you you know a guy who knows a guy and he hooks you up, that well, kind of sometimes, thing. Sometimes you know, well, uh, in Canada yeah. we get burned. This little pack in here, yeah, costs eight fifty in the United States. My goodness, costs fifty seven bucks up here in Canada. All right, well there you go, yeah. uh, Joe Purdue and Jonathan Dodd. Now you have your answer about yeah. what Thomas. Oh, by the way, if anyone wants to send me a care package, <laughs> I appreciate it. Just make sure you mark a gift because they they ask if you don't they'll ask for duty on it and duty in Canada is basically a five hundred percent markup. <laughs> well, do with that what you will, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is funny. Um, a good friend, uh, actually. Before we get to that one, so I'm I'm curious uh, myself. You've it's you're actually you know i heard an interview where you were over the years you've casted over a hundred tracks is that true no not a hundred i've cast okay. maybe, i've passed maybe eight to ten yeah i listened to that way wrong my bad yeah. <laughs> i'm gonna go back and listen to that again yeah. uh but uh what do you feel like the most uh is there a track that you casted that really um jumps out in your memory uh one that was that was pretty cooler than the others of the eight to ten that you uh well the whole situation to. was uh, there was a time there where i was married for a little while my okay. ex-wife was putting a lot of pressure to put the sasquatch thing on the back burner and concentrate on more important things in 1986, I consider that the best year of my life because I, I basically had all this accumulated leave because the seven years I spent in the Army, I never took it much leave and oh, sure. I had to use it up before before I, I could be released. So I basically had the whole summer of 1986 off with pay. Wow. So I, I left home in late May and I didn't come home till Halloween night. Oh, yeah, man. that didn't impress you very much. Yeah, that wouldn't do it. Yeah, yeah. But during that, in August of 1986, I heard about an incident along the Chilliwack River in a campground down there that it had just happened uh, a day before. So I went rushing down there, and it was a dirt road still back then. It's paved okay. today. And it's called Riverside Recreation Area. I don't think it was named in that game. And I drove in today what is considered the exit right in the entrance. And as I'm driving in, I see this red pickup truck with Utah license plates and a camper coming out. I stop, and they stop, and I said, have you folks ever heard of anything strange being seen here? Lately? And the woman said, oh, you mean the big fight? And the, <laughs> husband, the husband looked at her like, the, oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it was them. And, wow. Uh, and uh, and uh, they they put off their leaving because this was Expo year, so they're up here doing her thing at Expo. And now they're on the second half of their vacation. Do what he wanted to do was camping and fishing. <laughs> okay. Before heading back, they're from Salt Lake City. They're vacationing up here. All she remembers is this gorilla-like thing had gone through their campsite while they were down at the riverbank fishing, and had snatched a stringer of fish they had hanging from a hook that they put the lantern on. And it took off through their campsite, crossed the road, and disappeared along the banks of Baldbeard Creek. They never made any attempt to go after it. You see more of it. Another guy in the campground came running up to them and said, did you see that? He saw it too, and I think he's the guy I ran into the town that told me that something had happened out there. Now, there were two other fellows down at the fire in the campground, but when I was down there interviewing them, I talked to them about it. They were kind of snickering out of the whole thing. Kind of maybe it's vicious. 
So I went across the road after they went on and carried on with their vacation, gave me the story. I went across the road and I found the tracks. The witnesses never knew they were there. On the Mexico wow. Creek. There was 112 of them in all. And, uh, and of course, the clear ones were the ones right down by the creek bank, right? Where it was soft and muddy and stuff. And there were the tracks. I cast two of those. And as it moved off from the creek towards the bank of, uh, to the slope of Ford Mountain, it was more like marks in the grass or marks okay. in the ferns, things like that. But they were all kind of. And where they went under a batch of old growth trees, Suddenly, they were all over the place. You know, mm. no set. They were just all. Uh, the way I described it at the time, it was like a man searching the ground for his keys. You know? Oh, wow. And what I think happened, assuming the story is true, is the thing stopped and was checking to see if it was being followed. Okay. Because suddenly, at the other end, there was a line of tracks going through through the ferns towards the rocks in this rock slide area in Ford Mountain. And some of these rocks were the size of cars. Right, it was that big. That's where I lost the trail, and I never found anywhere where on the other side of that trail where it came out, and I never found the fish stringer either. But that was the best set of tracks I ever found, and that's what convinced me not to give up on the Sasquatch question. And that was uh, basically what started dissolving my marriage to my my ex wife. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah. that just did everything at once for you, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, "There's no way I'm quitting on this." Wow. No, yeah. That, that's the one that did it. wasn't the first set of tracks, alleged tracks I ever saw, but it was the first I ever tried to cast. And the first thing I discovered was, boy, does it take a lot of plaster pairs to fill one. <laughs> mm, you know, I was buying these large, you know, yeah. milk carton like. <laughs> ah, from now on, it's big bags. <laughs> I couldn't believe how much it actually took to fill. It took all my plaster pairs just to cast two of the prints, and. Uh, I, and from that point on, I, I never stopped. Is there anywhere you can go to see those uh, casts, or are they just in oh, your I private? I have one here. One of them's lost now, but I have still okay. have one of them here, yeah. yeah. Okay, so in your private yeah. collection. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Nice. That's a crazy story. Wow. Uh, Alex Petikoff, uh writes to you, and he says, uh, what is the most interesting report from British Columbia, oh my goodness, British Columbia that you've heard or investigated personally? Like, what's one that really sticks out to you? In 2006, there were two incidents on uh, this is British Columbia. I have my favorites. There were two reports from two different people who didn't know each other, okay? On, uh, on, uh, Bridal Falls Forest Service Road that goes really high up in the hill. There's a great big lookout way up there that couples like to go to, you know, to look at the lights across the Fraser Valley and the distance and stuff mm -hmm. like that. This couple was coming back. This is like two in the morning. She actually never saw it. Okay. All she remembers is her husband suddenly slammed the brake, brought to the hall and said, you have see that damn thing? And she's going, no, what? What are you talking about? That and then he suddenly pulled ahead, seemed to look in the bush where something it looked like something had plowed through the bushes there. And then he pulled off right where, where Bridal Falls Creek is that goes down to the and, and the falls. And he started telling her, and finally it clicked in there. Are you saying you saw a Sasquatch? He said, No, there's no such thing as a Sasquatch. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said. This guy's been hunting his whole life. He's heard stories, but he never believed it, and he still will not say it was a Sasquatch. After I interviewed him in his home and stuff and got the whole story, he said, I don't know what else it couldn't have been. It fits the description what everyone says is a Sasquatch, but it can't be a Sasquatch because there's no such thing as a Sasquatch. And it was kind of funny. He told his wife after the incident, you tell nobody, nobody what we saw here tonight. Okay? Nobody. But she told her friend. <laughs> and that's all it takes. Who told her husband. Yeah. And her husband worked at the sawmill where I lived and he remembered me and what I did. So within 24 hours, I'm giving this fellow a phone call. And the first thing he says to me is, how the hell did you find out? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, but I managed to calm him down. And I promised confidentiality. I've never revealed their names. And I promised confidentiality. And I went there and I interviewed them at their home, not too far from Battle Falls. 
And, and then he, we went up and looked at the site where it actually happened. We could see where something had come up across the road and plowed through the bush. There were no discernible tracks. We could see the trail. And the mountain in that part, it's like an angle like that. We were going down, myself and Blade Bill Miller were going down. And we had to brace ourselves pulling on the trees and stuff where we would have tumbled, right? This thing came up in a straight line crossroad and kept right on going, plowed right through the bushes. You could see it. You've probably seen photographs of that case on the internet and stuff. And uh, where something went through there. And it, and he still will not say it's a Sasquatch. He still will not do it. And even all these years later, he still won't do it. And uh, the interesting thing is the Chilliwack paper decided to do a story on the Sasquatch question in general. And my Bill and I said, well, we were just investigating this as it just happened a day or so ago. If you, we won't reveal their names. So they sent two reporters up and we showed them where it happened. And we went up to the high viewpoint and talked about the Sasquatch in general. And they wrote an article that appeared in the two packs that titled, if you go in the woods today, well, this other young man saw it and said, my God, I saw something on that same road later on that evening. Oh, wow. And he contacted the paper and the paper put him in touch with us. Mm. And we went out and we interviewed him at the spot where he saw it. Well, while we were in him, we realized he did not see it the following evening. He actually saw it four and a half hours before. Ooh. Half a kilometer further down the same road. He came around the corner. It was leaning against a feeder stump or a nursing stump, as they call them, where a big old growth tree has a new tree growing out of it. And he said, that thing just panicked when my headlights hit it. And it scrambled up over the top of that stump and went crashing down through the brush on the side. Uh, on the side. He could hear it going. You know, if I tried to do what he said this thing done, I would have broken a hip or a leg or something like that. It was no kind of, he said, this thing just went crashing down. I could hear it going. When I hit it, it climbed, it scrambled up over the stump. It didn't go around the stump. It went over the stump and crashed down through the trees, down we, I could hear it going. Now, what I think it was, was, even though I can't say this with 100% certainty, I think it's a high probability that both these cases saw the same animal. One guy saw it going down, mm. and a couple coming back, four and a half hours later, saw it coming back up. You know, that's what I think, personally. Can't sure. say that with 100% certainty, but they were two sightings, Four and a half hours apart, less than half a kilometer apart on the same small stretch of Forest Service Road. That's yeah. wild. Yeah. Has there been a, well, over the years, uh, you investigating, researching, what do you feel the closest you've come to a Sasquatch is personally? Oh, 2004, it's possible I saw one myself. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I won't say so because the facts are, and I stick to the facts and everything. Sure. I saw a figure. Okay. It appeared to be jet black in color and it appeared to be walking upright. But the facts also are it was close to a mile away on a cut line with a high power line to go right through the forest. I only saw it for about four seconds as it walked from the center of the cut line to disappear in the trees on the left right side. It was too far away to see detail. Uh, yeah. So I either saw the biggest weirdest look on man I ever did, or I saw a Sasquatch, one or the other. So I generally say I saw a figure in March of 2004. I will not say it was a Sasquatch because I can't say with 100% certainty it was. I stick to the facts, never deviate the facts. I saw a figure. It moved to the right. It disappeared to cover the distance halfway across that cut line in about four seconds. It was gone. I only had time to bring my old Land Rover to a halt. The only, the man who was with me, a buddy of mine, John Miles, who was giving a ride up to the 20 mile bay camp, he saw it too, or he claimed to have. Okay. Yeah, I had the camera and I got out, brought the camera up to take a picture, but it was gone that fast. It yeah. Didn't, yeah, wow. didn't get it. And uh, I don't know if that was a Sasquatch, I have personally seen it. If it was not a Sasquatch, I still have not. Mm, very, very I, interesting. But the way I remember it, 
I think if I put a seven foot man up where that was and went back to my vantage point, I'd barely see him at all. This really? Thing, well, I remember this thing was big even for a Sasquatch. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. I can't say I don't know. Memory plays tricks. You know, we've all done it as kids. You've gone back to a place you haven't seen since you're five years old or 10 years old, and you can't get over how small it looks. Absolutely. You remember, you know, or how much bigger that boulder was and you actually remember having fun playing hide and seek around it. You know, that yep. kind of thing. It, it happens all the time. Memory plays strange tricks. So who knows? Who knows what I saw in March of 2004? Mm. Yeah, I saw something. I just can't confirm what it was. There you go. Mm -hmm. Do you mind if we talk uh, about uh, Renee for a few minutes? No, you can talk about anything you like. Okay. So the, the character of Renee de Hinden, it, it, you know, to me, it just seems like the, it must have been quite the guy to know. Do you mind sharing with how you met him, what it was like, you know, talking to him, all that good stuff? Renee was Renee. There's no other way to describe him. Mm. Okay. I first met Renee when he called me. Wow. He was in coming through Western Alberta, heading back to BC. And he was staying at the Lake Louise campground. He asked me, uh, because this is like a couple of years after I started, I'm gotten to be a gnome a little bit. And he wanted to meet me. So uh, I went out and drove all the way out to Lake Louise to meet him because I was very, I really wanted to meet him. And uh, I walked in, I recognized his truck right away, that old green camper, green Hornet truck he used to drive for years and years and years. And I knock on the door. I could hear clinking inside. And he's just standing at the campground, clinking inside. And I'm going to, uh, uh, Mr. Hen and Thomas Steamer here. And I hear this voice come up from the truck. Who cash? <laughs> <laughs> That was my introduction to the late Renny Dehan. We became friends and, uh, and colleagues long after that, though I pissed him off more times than I care to mention. Oh, you did? Oh, oh you, man. Well, I knew all the old guard, you know, and Rennie would always say, so what did that Tempest think about this or that? You know, or <laughs> what the hell is that Glean doing now? You know, or something like that. And I, I'd tell him, Renny, I'm not going to tell you. I don't tell them what you said or do, and I won't tell you what they said or do. He didn't like it, but he accepted it. And he never held it against me. And he held it against so many others. Sure. He never held it against me. I'd like to say, I, I'd like to say, I loved the late Randy Mahindan, and, and he loved me sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah. But the funniest thing, the funniest Randy story I could tell you is up uh, Garnet Creek Forest Service Road. I think it was Garnet Creek, not Ruby Creek. Garnet Creek Forest Service Road. I was out with Renee during the day and we were looking around because back then in this area, it was great for finding tracks if you could find anything. And we decided to stop, you know, and brew up some tea and have our lunch. Renee always had this little folding table, right? And he, Renee was very simple. He, his idea of lunch was a hunk of cheese, a couple of buns, and an apple or something, you know? Yeah. All right. So he had this big, Big bun, he put it on the table and he in the cooler. I don't know what kind of bird it was. It was the most beautiful yellowish blue color. <laughs> but I picked up that bun and I had trouble lifting it because it like it's cut up eight feet off the ground, but couldn't go any higher. And it's slowly <laughs> going down the path of this bun. And really, can't make that back or that's all thinking. And he goes running after the damn <laughs> That's funny. The fight of the bird, I got you see the bun drop, and the bird go pew, shoots off. <laughs> because it, it's ready. You're not going to eat that, are you? He goes, nah, but I just didn't want him to have it. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, do you think he would have been able to, like, do you think today's Bigfooting world would have been able to handle Renee at all? No, and I don't think Renee can handle today's Bigfoot community. Oh, that, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Renee passed away in 2001 before the internet really, really took off. Oh, that's true. Yeah. I mean, his big events is someone finally gave him a fax machine he knew how to use it. He was amazed by that. Hmm. <laughs> uh, no, uh, Renee would. He, 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 
I'm sure with things that have happened in the Sasquatch field since his death, he's making him turn over his grave. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You also uh, spent time with uh, John Green, correct? Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. what, was, what was he like as an individual? John Green was an absolute gentleman. Hmm. An absolute gentleman. Didn't tolerate off-color jokes. But he did like a good, clean joke. But when you got when he got mad, he couldn't stand Peter Byrne. <laughs> a lot of people couldn't stand Peter Byrne. But that's why I kept my correspondence and you know with Peter Byrne a secret because John Green was very well known for saying, "If you do any work with Peter Byrne, you'll never do anything with me." Is that how he yeah. talks? Kind of like John yeah, Green? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how really he wow. Just look at old recordings of John Green. Okay, Listen. yeah, I'll check. Bill Miller could impersonate him a lot better than I could, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that was John, and um, an absolute gentleman, absolute excellent before the internet and stuff, accumulator of data, mm. you know, and uh, logical mind. Great in the bush, he was tall and lanky. Had a bad habit of not ducking when a branch came flying back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the worst driver in the world. Oh no! Oh my God! How he lived so long, driving the way he did is an absolute miracle. Wow! Yeah, he was the worst driver I ever saw, and. I asked June, his late wife, how can you stand? Like, when you go to Alberta to visit your kids and stuff, how can you stand? She says, I just tune out. Just I tune out. I relax. Out. I put music in my head. And I close my eyes. <laughs> and pray. It's just, I mean, he was that bad. You know, he was that bad. Wow. Yeah, I, I don't know how he lived so long, really. Because I saw him take chances you wouldn't believe. Yeah. Worst driver in the world. But, you know, a logical mind when it came to the Sasquatch and stuff. I like to think he had more of an influence me on me than anybody else, really. Oh, wow. Yeah. Why, why would you say that? I don't know. A lot of people comment in my books sound a lot like his. Okay. Right? Yeah. Because I had the same writing style, right? Sort of like, you know, that's why I got when I, one of the arguments I got with in with the publisher, most of my books were put out by Hancock House. The Alberta book, the first edition, was put out by Western Publishers, a company that no longer exists. Okay. Yeah. And it was republished by Hancock House in 2018, which is probably the version you saw. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I, had, I got one, a yeah. lot of arguments with Hancock House or the editors of Hancock because they wanted me to clean up the language and stuff in the interviews and stuff. And I said, look, the, the, the reader will get a much better impression of who you're talking to if they hear what, if they read what they said word for word. I'm not interviewing Christopher Hitchens every time here, you know? <laughs> You've got to say it, and that includes the ums and the ahs and stuff yes. like that. You know? Yes. And uh, John helped me with that. He, 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 he told me, he said, you know, I should have done it that way too. <laughs> you know, wow. because you, you want the, the reader to get an accurate, picture of who you're talking to and who you're dealing with, right? And if you make everyone sound like an English professor or out of the university, that's not an accurate. It's not believable. Yeah, yeah. it's not accurate. And well, but I went out in the end and I think it was a good decision. Yeah. Yeah. And John was great in that uh, on getting stuff done that way. And when we did meet the Sasquatch, John would I don't think we should include this. Pepper would say, "You, oh, we have to include this, John." And I'd say, "Okay, here we go again." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that is. Funny. But I'm going to find the deciding vote. <laughs> oh, but, you were the deciding vote on. Not some... all the time. Sometimes it was some me stuff? and Chris arguing about something, and John would be the deciding. Vote. Oh, that is funny. But all the arguments we were Chris. I noticed, you know, <laughs> me and Chris, or John and Chris, and never me and John. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, wild. you know, it came out of well. It did that. 
Uh, Jacques Vrain was an absolute, but you know, old age is a terrible thing. Uh, sure. When you get up in your eighties, witnessing the physical decline of an individual, you know, you knew for years, it's just a, it's, it's a sad thing to watch. Yeah. And I, and on my last meeting with John, I went to see him in his retirement homeroom about a month before he passed. And it, uh, it, I wanted to take a lot. I, I, I didn't take any photographs because it quite frankly, no, yeah. people don't want to see him like this. Yeah. I remember the way he was, you know, and uh, I didn't do it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. John seemed to go downhill after June died. June died a few years before he did. He, I don't think he ever got over it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. June was his lay wife. Yeah. He, he's a guy, you know, I've, I've never heard anything. I've never heard anyone talk bad about him, which I think is to. Well, oh, you never talked to him. I ran into Hinden, didn't you? Oh, that's okay. Well, no, I never got an interview run into <laughs> Hinden. <laughs> Did they, because they went back and forth, didn't they? Oh, well, they were par kind of partners at, at the beginning. I mean, Ready to Hinden got John Green involved. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ready to Hinden showed up in John Green's house. John was editor for a paper in Agassi. And the only thing he ever did with the Sasquatch was write an April Fool's story about a girl being taken away from the, from the Harrison Resort by one. You know, it was an April Fool's story. The sign of this Swiss immigrant shows up and he just wants to go out hunting the Sasquatch. John told me he did everything he could convince Renny. It's nothing but an Indian legend. You don't have to. You know, but Randy wouldn't listen. And Randy got him to look at some of these stories. And that's how they found out about the Ruby Creek incident, you know, and the Jack, alleged Jack choke capture in Yale, things like that. Hmm. John looked into it and he, he wasn't hearing about a, a big Indian with long hair on the head. He was, he was hearing these stories of an ape-like creature and he became intrigued. So it was to him that got John Green going. Wow. That's very interesting. Mm-hmm. For, you know, for people that are getting into Bigfoot right now, you know, newer to the field, but, you know, you want to make sure that you, you, you figure it out, you learn all the stuff that's come before. What, what books, are there books that you recommend uh, for newer Bigfooters that they should pick up so that they, they get all the, the history, they get all the stuff that's been done before? Ivan T. Sanders' book in 1961, The Balm of Snowman, Legend Come to Life, John okay. Green's books, and his major work, Sasquatch Each Among Us in 1978, any book by Thomas Steenberg, right. and exactly. any book by Chris Murphy, Thomas yep. Steenberg, and John Green. <laughs> yeah, good one. Uh, uh, Meldrum's book, Sorry, I just looked at the Sasquatch. That's a good read. John Benenagel's books are good to read. Yeah. Look at it from a scientific point. Any book that looks at the mystery from a zoological scientific stance. Mm. And there are other books that make connect with UFOs and ghosts, throw them in the garbage. That's my advice, in my opinion. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Thinking over the the years uh, since 78, was there something, was there an incident that you uh, investigated that just took a hold of your life and you found yourself always being drawn back to that, uh, anything like that, that was just, it, it took you in a hole. Well, earlier I said I had my favorites, my favorite, I didn't include it earlier because it wasn't in BC, it was Southwestern Alberta. So it was the Crandall campground. Incident. Oh, I love this. This is so good. Yeah. I, I was watching this on Sasquatch archives and it's in your book too. Mm -hmm. And it's so good. Yeah. I, I wrote about it in the Alberta book. I wrote about it in search of giants. We covered it again in other books. Yeah, it's been I've written about it quite extensively. I'm, I, it just fascinated me. I must have went to that area when I was in Alberta. I must have went to that Crandall campground about, I don't know, 10 times. Wow. Look at that area afterwards. Yeah. Alan Deb, Park Warden Alan Deb. Uh, it, it, by the way, in Canada, um, they're called wardens in national parks, not rangers. Okay. So wardens, yeah, Alan did. He told me he did everything to try and convince these four people that they must have seen a bear standing up. They'd have no problem with it. 
they'd have no part of it. You know, four witnesses, possibly uh, seven witnesses, because there are three people in, other, in a pickup truck that said they saw something too, but I was never able to track them down. I was never able to track them down. But our four main witnesses, they did the rare thing. They went and made a report to the park warrants office, and one of the witnesses uh, uh, insisted on writing something out. They were perfectly willing just to hear the story and leave it at that. But no, he insisted. He wants something to write. And I think that report is probably still on file in the, in the warden's office in Waterton Lakes National Park in Alberta. Wow. Yeah, it's still there. Yeah. Uh, four witnesses claim they have seen this thing. They saw it very close up. I interviewed all four of them separately. The story is fascinating. It's wondering what next to the Bighorn Dam incident of 1969. It's probably Alberta's most well-known Sasquatch incident. And I think it may be considered a Sasquatch classic someday. If not, it should be. I mean, it's it's fascinating yeah. to read. Mm -hmm. It's really, really good. Uh, people need to check that out. Uh, I would say for, Al, you know, and this is just from reading your book, but I would say it's probably one of the cooler stories from Alberta for sure. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Do you think that current, looking at current Bigfoot researchers, do you think we're close to closing the case on it or no, we really not. haven't moved the needle at all in, in the last, you no, know? No, uh, no, no. Uh, we're spinning our wheels. The only thing I can say is we got prettier equipment when we do it. You know, I'm, um, I mean, no, we're still trying to answer question one, does it exist or not? And there are too many people who they refer to themselves as researchers, but they're not. They're not. Okay. They're more like religious fanatics trying to push a faith. Talk to me about that. What makes, what's the difference between a Bigfoot researcher versus a uh, person who's trying to push their Bigfoot oh, research. religion? I prefer the term investigator, but okay. fine. Uh, an investigator researcher, a true researcher, is someone who could, has to admit that in the end they could turn out to be wrong. You know, I fully accept the possibility that in the end it may turn out the Sasquatch is nothing more than great North American myth and mythology. Mm. I don't personally believe that yet, but I accept the possibility. All these people are like religious these push their faith. They're like a Old priest on a pulpit, you know. The Lord said there is a Sasquatch. Damn, you got to believe it or you will go to hell. Right. You know? <laughs> I'm exaggerating, but you know what I'm talking about. I got, no, I got it, yeah. They feel it's their job to prove it to everyone else. And everything that happens is Sasquatch. Ooh, I heard a stick snap. Sasquatch did it. Ooh, that tree branch is broken. Sasquatch did it. <laughs> you know, everything is Sasquatch. Ooh, those strange sounds. I don't know what else could have done it. It's got to be a Sasquatch. Now, there's all kinds of strange sounds. In my opinion, noises in the woods or noises at night, if you don't see what did it, there could be other explanations for it. All right? Of all the recordings of alleged Sasquatch vocalization, the one that fascinates me still is the Lummy Incidents of 1975. Wow, you, okay, I, I've never heard of that, that one. Oh, you probably have, but you know, it was it's okay. recorded made by um, the late Deputy Sheriff Kenny Cooper. Okay. Who recorded, and the reason why these ones are famous, I'm fascinated because even though no one saw the animal vocalize the sounds, the animal was in view just moments before the sounds were heard. Hmm. It disappeared in the trees. These screaming noise just came out of the came out of the uh, out of the woods. And Kenny Cooper, he later changed his name to his Lummy name, which has got like 45 letters in it, and I can't begin to pronounce it, so I still call him Kenny Cooper. Unfortunately, he's passed away now. But he had the presence of mind to tell them to turn on the dictaphone back in the headquarters, and he held his police mic out of the car, and he recorded the sounds. Wow. Yeah, so it was done and, and recorded over the dictaphone, in the police headquarters. I got them here if you like to hear them. I, I would love to, because I was just thinking, where where can we hear these, you know? like Let's see if this works. All right. Yeah. 
That's weird. That's it. And you got to remember that was recorded over the airwaves, over police radio, on the receiving speaker in the headquarters, and recorded on what's a dictaphone. And no one under the age of 50 will, rem will remember what a dictaphone is. It was right. how we recorded phone conversations way back in the good old days. Tell me what the name of that of that audio is again you used before. It's called the Lummy Recordings from 1975. The Lummy Indian Reserve just south in Washington, just south of the Canadian border here in the West Coast. Is Every now and then, they seem to have a rash of incidents there, uh, especially during the salmon runs. They seem to have a rash of incidents. 1975 was a particularly busy year for reports. Okay. Um, Before that, 1969 was a busy year. You may recall an old documentary um, uh, mysterious monsters uh, uh, hosted by I can't remember his actual name, but he played the Mission Impossible, the guy, actor with the white hair. Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, they did a uh, instance in the Nooksack River there. That was also on the Lummi Indian Reserve, and that was 1969, where uh, a, a, a Lummi fellow named John Green, no relation to the John mm. Green media, claimed that a Sasquatch was trying to steal fish out of his nets, and he was very close to it. He actually passed. A, he actually took a lie detector test for the for the documentary and passed. Yeah, but it seems like these kind of things break out there along the Nooksack River and the Lummi Reserve every so often. Some salmon run years there are no reports at all. Others, a dozen people will say something. And in this case, a woman said, phoned up the police department, said there's a big hairy thing in my backyard, and they all rushed down there. And they had their spotlights on it, and they had their guns drawn, too. But the thing took wow. off, disappeared in the trees, and about 20 seconds after it disappeared in the trees, these noises came out of the trees. And he and he recorded it. That is awesome. I'm going to definitely it. look more into that. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. What, what do you feel the most important skills for a Bigfoot investigator or researcher to have today are? A vastly host, host, a vast quantity of common sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And a healthy dose of skepticism is the best attribute any investigator researcher can have. Mm. Just because someone says they saw a sash cross doesn't mean it's so. Like I said earlier, there's only three possibilities you can consider. One, they actually saw a sash cross. Two, they mistook something or someone for a Sasquatch, or three, they're lying. Right. And unfortunately, in this day and age, number three seems to be the most common. Very interesting. How did I've heard different places that you've you've dealt with a few uh, hoaxers over the years? Uh, What's your advice for for dealing with a hoax or a hoaxer when it might be uh, something? even close to you. I, I think there was one that happened on a trip you were on, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've been exposed hoaxers before. There are some people I know that I know have done some suspicious things in the past, too. That's another drawback in the world of uh, researchers and investigators. There are some people out there who call themselves investigators. They're in a hurry to be famous, mm. right? They're in a hurry. They're not willing to do the work. They want to be known right now. And how do they do that? They lie through their ass. It works if until they get caught. But once they get caught, your credibility is gone. Sure. Like you've heard of the name Todd Stead. Yep. I'll just say, in my opinion, I don't believe a word the man says. And I'll okay. leave it there. Yeah, I don't believe a word the man says. Uh, a fellow here in, I personally caught throwing rocks, Randy Brisson. He's still on the internet all the time, and he has his legion of followers. I caught mm. him hosting in 2009. Wow. Period. Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. And yeah, one part of your job is don't get along drawn out wars, these people, because other people keep bringing them up. But just say, I I know this is a hoax. And they say, well, why don't you prove me hoax? I said, well, I have better <laughs> things to do than follow Todd standing around. I'm trying to find these whether or not the Sasquatch exists. I don't want to waste time following Todd Stanton. Yeah, I, people get Just to... Look, uh, at his, yeah. look at his claims, turn on your common sense switch, and you're gullible enough to still believe what he's telling you. Mm. Well, fine. Yeah. Have a good life chasing your tail. Yep. Chasing okay. your tail. I got better things to do. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, uh, this is not me referring to any person, but uh, there's a lot of uh, hero worship in Bigfoot, it seems, today, and people uh, forget well, that. You have to actually any, go out and look for it. In any other field. That's true. There, That's there, true, there yeah. are people who earn the respect. Yep. And, them, and there are people who blow it out their ass and get it through. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, means and you're always going to get people because the general public let's face it there's a lot of gullible people out there who will believe anything I, I yeah i agree with you i could start a religion tomorrow for the worship of hockey pucks and i probably have 40 followers in, uh, in about a month it's probably already out there yeah, yeah. In, in canada yeah the most scariest <laughs> thing is these people are allowed to vote <laughs> right yeah uh, you know there's a lot of gullible people out there who will believe anything you know yeah. and that's just the reality of it but I'm not interested. It's like Rennie said once. I'm not interested in Sasquatch in his goddamn mind. I'm interested in Sasquatch out there in the bush. Gotcha. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah De Hinden was quite the dude from what yeah. I've read. Um, there's a there's a question that I want to make sure that I get in. Uh, Megan says, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Jacko? The Jacko story is a classic tale. Okay. okay? It's one of the classic tales. Was it? Is it a true story or was it an example of 19th century tabloid journalism? I don't know. John Kirk thinks he has evidence that the whole thing was made up and he has some valid points. I have found evidence that I think it could have been true and I think I have valid points. Uh, it either happened or it didn't. The point is it's already 160 years too late to prove. Wow. Yeah. If it was, I wrote a, a, a forward for a little booklet put out by Chris Murphy, the late Barry Blunt. I said it was a great opportunity to solve a great mystery before the mystery became great, and it just didn't happen. Uh, yeah. So was it true or was it not? People got to remember, John Green used to get, a, and people like John Green used to get offended with this because they like to think that, the Canadian West was somehow more civilized than the American West because, after all, we were part of the British Empire. I don't know. Oh, that's funny. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it was just as bad in many cases, it was even worse. Wow. Yale in 1884 was hell on earth. I mean, it, what's that show that was on HBO a, a number of years ago? Deadwood? Oh, sure. Yeah. They could have called that Yale town and would have fit right in it. In that British Columbia? Yeah. And there okay. was a week went by without a gunfight, a stabbing, a oh, murder, wow. a hang. <laughs> you know, and in 1884, there were 15,000 people in Yale. There's only like 80 people there today. Man. Because it was at the end, tail end of the Caribou Gold Rush. Okay. Yeah. So it was a, it was a hazardous place. There was the RCMP did not exist in British Columbia in 1884. They had so every town and community had a sheriff. You know they had jails. Half the buildings were brothels. The other half were saloons. Sure. Yeah, you know, and uh, it was just a wild west town. And for something like this to gain attention from the populace for a little while, had to have some merit, in my opinion. Now, whether it was true or not, I don't know. It's a classic tale. Unfortunately, it's just destined to remain that, just a classic tale. Mm. Right up there with the Ruby Creek classic tale, the Albert Osman kidnapping, the Fred Beck and the Eight Canyonists and it, you know, all classic tales that you we've all read in the early books over and over and over again. Yeah. Do you think there'll be any tales from uh, today that will be considered classic tales in the future? Well, I think the Cranville Campground is from Alberta in 1981. Oh, yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. But again, that's not up to me. <laughs> that's true. That's up. That is a good point. It's up to future yeah. generations. We won't yeah. be here. Yeah. Um, good. That's a great point. <laughs> yeah. The guy who shoots a Sasquatch brings in the body. That'll be a classic tale, but it'll be the end of it. Do you think that's what it's going to take for uh, for science to get on board? That science, that's the only thing the scientific community will accept. Yeah. When you ever ask them, and I have, what do you need to confirm that the Sasquatch exists? There's another species of primate out there. They're, they're unanimous. They need a body or piece of the body or sufficient skeletal remains. Then okay. they'll be examined 
improvement. And no amount of politically correct wishful thinking will ever change that because that's just the way it works. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it would be, oh man, I, I've thought about it a little bit, but it's like, man, you, you take one down, you know, there's probably another one and they're no. not going to be happy and you better be ready for the other one to come out. And it's just like, man, my goodness. Oh, the other one make this retreat. Yeah. I think the SAS question, real partial reason for their success, assuming they actually do exist, mm -hmm. is their non territorial behavior. Mm. Because they seem to yield the ground to the first intruder, human or animal. And that's probably more than anything else is the key to their success, their elusiveness by nature. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 Who knows? I've got a uh, shot in the dark question. And this is just, we'll see if it lands, it lands. And if you say, I don't know anything about it, don't worry about it. Um, right now in the circles of people that are into Bigfoot, they're also into this, uh, these tales that come out of Canada from the Nahani Valley. Oh yeah. Do you know anything I, about that? The Nahani Valley, I spent 13 days in a canoe expedition there all the way along this line. Yeah. Is this Southern N Nahani? Yeah, but, but North and Southern Nahani. As soon as okay, you get above we... Victoria Falls, you're in the north and you get south of, and you portage around oh the Oh my falls. goodness, can we talk about there this three for a bit? Uh, high of Niagara, so, uh, yeah, and, and the lower Nahani Butte all the way in the north. Yeah. That was a great trip, 1985. Uh, I was with the Mortar Platoon and we did a summer expedition up there. I was looking for Sasquatch evidence, other guys were into other things. Yeah. So you were looking for Sasquatch evidence I in was, the Nahani yes, Valley. Yes. yes, I was. Yeah. Wow. And all the old stories, you know, about the Headless Valley and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The part is uh, these creatures are supposed to be there, according to First Nation legend, and they were very hostile to humans and stuff like that. And uh, uh, a whole a whole uh, tribe of First Nations people disappeared and were never seen again. That's actually true. Mm. Whether or not they just died out, who knows, or died in an avalanche or something, we don't know. There were several men over the years who were found with their heads missing, and thus the legend yeah. of, of the head hunting creature. The old man who used to go up there every year that the National Film Board made a film about in the early 60s, he, he would go prospect and work his way up the river every year. I actually spent the night in his cat, what was left of his cabin. And, of one of the prospectors? Yeah, yeah. And, really? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a great area, and I tell you, man, we got we got out of our tent sometimes in the morning to see fresh grizzly trucks right outside. Oh man! After the first day, we decided, okay, we got one rifle. We'll have one man on watch all night long. Yeah, yeah, it was. It's a beautiful, beautiful, wild wilderness place. It it, it was one of the best outdoor adventures I have ever been on. Is it as so hard as? Days. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. It took thirteen days. Canoeing wow. down, yeah, yeah, canoeing down, yeah. As hard to get into that area as, yes, as you, they say, you, yeah. The only way in is by full plane. Wow. You come up the river by boat, there are no roads. Yeah. It's a national heritage site now. It's yeah. Preserved. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I guess the question, did you, did you find anything related no. to uh, Sasquatch up there? No. No. Saw a lot of bear tracks. Okay. A lot of things, and a lot of wildlife. Never saw any sign of Sasquatch anywhere in the Heidi River. But that don't mean nothing. I was only there for 13 days in 1985. <laughs> so, that's yeah. awesome. That's that's yeah. awesome, though. You can say you're in the Nahani yeah. uh, on a little adventure. That's amazing. Yeah. Just make sure you get, if you're going to canoe down that river, make sure you get out of that river, that last part before Virginia Falls, or no one's ever going to see you again. Oh, really? You'll that's just go over it? Yeah. Go over and be After that's the 10-mile canyon that's just straight rapids. For 10 oh, my miles. goodness. Yeah. yeah. You'll be yeah. You'll be out of there. Yeah. Um, the other, the other stories, Canada has so many amazing stories. I love, I love it. Um, they have, you guys have some stories about dinosaurs up there. Have you ever Again, heard these, like, Valley. well, yeah, that's true. Good point. Yeah, and Partridge, yeah, uh, Partridge yeah. Creek up yeah. monster in, uh, Yukon, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. There's the stories of, uh, of the Nahani Valley, about prehistoric Valley there and stuff, but. I, I think that's just more legend. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah and stuff. I don't think it's based on anything. There have been reports in the world of crypto all the other than Sash, but you get we get reports of, you know, the giant salamander every now and then is seen or reported and and and, and the giant uh, ground sloth has been reported in areas of BC as well. But oh, really? They're, they're, they're not nearly to the extent of Sasquatch. Right. And of course, in our lakes and rivers, you got Ogopogo and Okanagan all up and down the coast. You got True. Caddy, the Cabriosaurus, which is a, a sea serpent of some kind that's reported all up and down the West Coast, not just British Columbia, but Alaska, Washington, Oregon. Yeah. What? Why, do you have a a reason as to what? Why is British Columbia such a hot spot and a magnet for all this stuff? Because it's a lot of wilderness and there's hardly any people. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And the whole population of Canada is equal to the population of California. Wow. Yeah. And eighty percent of that is within an hour's drive of the American border because this is the warm part. <laughs> <laughs> And on the West Coast, we got mild winters. Everywhere else in Canada, it's a deep freeze half the year. You know, it's a rugged place. Yeah. Hmm. That is that is very cool. Wow. I did not expect to talk to you about uh, Nahani Valley tonight, and that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, this has been... Well, a we wrote a big thing on the Nahani Valley. We included it in the BC book. Me and Chris... had a lot of... I wasn't sure. It's great stories. And I thought, okay, I'd like to put them in the book. But the Yukon is not BC, Chris. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So you yeah, have the people all... came from BC up there. Okay. <laughs> so you have all these stories from like the Yukon uh, that well, are pretty much there, not published. There's an author who just published a book on on the Yukon. Um, oh, his name's going on. Man. His first name is Red. I can't remember his last. Yeah, name. Yeah, I saw that on. Uh, uh, it looks interesting. Yeah, it, it, it looks very interesting. It's very interesting. Some that caught it going to the woo, but. Uh, mm -hmm. Other than that, it's, it, he's keeping a record of them up there. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Ren Hollinger. Hollinger! Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, right. I met him just uh, on Vancouver Island recently at a conference. Uh, it's a fascinating read, yeah. It's a fascinating read. I need to check that out. Yeah, yeah. Thomas, thank you for for hanging out uh, tonight. This has been a really, really fun chat. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Uh, before we go, I do want to make sure uh, if there's any closing thoughts you have uh, and also if there's uh, anything that you want to make sure the listeners check out, please, by all means, take the time to do that as well. In my opinion, I'll just say this to all your listeners. If you're going to get involved in the investigation of the Sasquatch community, please, please leave the lunatic fringe behind. Don't become one of the inmates running the asylum. Have a scientific zoological approach, a healthy dose of skepticism, and always has a philosophy of stick to the facts and never deviate from the facts. Mm. Okay. Very good. Don't be in a hurry. Because if you are, you're in this for the wrong reason anyway. Sure. Yeah. yeah. See, I gave up. Two decades ago, caring whether the general public believes in the existence of the Sasquatch. I do this still because I want to know. Gotcha. I want to know. That's cool. I want to know if I'm right and they are there, or I want to know if I'm wrong and it's all myth and mythology. And if it is all myth and mythology, then I've done my part to catalog a good, great piece of North American myth and mythology. Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm listeners make sure that you uh look up uh thomas's books uh is best place to get those on like amazon or what would you recommend yeah yeah amazon hancock house still uh, uh okay also yeah so you can order them direct from the posture but i usually find them on the bookshelves if you find books on sasquatch or bigfoot as you call it in the united states uh you'll find those books there oh, usually yeah yeah i wish i could find bigfoot books in uh, in my area in Iowa, but uh, you usually don't see too many of those hanging around in Goodwill. But well, if you want to get a hold of, just contact Hanging House Publishers, and, uh, and you there you go, right there. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> awesome. Cool. Um, if uh, oh, if people in uh, Canada have a uh, report uh, out there in British Columbia, how can they uh, best contact you? Well, I'm on Facebook, 
Okay. I also have a blog talk page, Thomas Steamer, uh, dot com, W O Thomas Steamer dot com, but it's being repaired right now because uh, something happened. And of course, my uh, email is sasquatch at telus.net. And my phone number is 604 826 6150. I'm not afraid to give it out. If I get weird calls, I get them anyway. I like to record them and have a collection of weird Sasquatch calls. Oh, that would be amazing. <laughs> oh, thank you for coming on, Thomas. Uh, this has been a fun chat and uh, uh, have a great rest of your night, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. See you later. Thank you for listening to Bigfoot Society. If you like the show, please review and rate it five stars on iTunes. Hit the share button and send this episode to all your friends on social media. Subscribe to Bigfoot Society wherever you listen to podcasts. It doesn't cost a thing. Pick up a Bigfoot Society shirt or enamel pin over on our Etsy page and people will tell you all about their Bigfoot sightings when you wear it. At least that's what people tell us. That's what happens. If you'd like to become an official member of Bigfoot Society with a membership card, a community of like-minded individuals, and extra content each month, then please consider becoming a supporter of the podcast by going to www.patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot Society. Thanks for listening.